Sarah must have been quite a beauty. Man, she had to be a looker. Kind of wonder if she wasn't that proverbial trophy wife. Abraham went to her and said, you know, I know you're an exceptionally beautiful woman. I've seemed to have noticed that, Sarah. So when we get to Egypt where there's food, I'm afraid someone's going to take a look at you and because I'm your husband, they're going to do me in. Because if I'm out of the way, Sarah, somebody else could have you as a wife. So, so Sarah, I'm going to go down on my, my knee one more time for you. you. Would you please, would you please tell people that you're my sister? If they think I'm your brother, they'll let me live. They won't see any need to, to get rid of me so they can marry you. So, whew, Sarah, would you save my neck? Sarah agreed. And so when they got to Egypt, that's exactly what happened. The Egyptians noticed, hey, this is really quite a, quite a good-looking gal that is coming in with her brother. Pharaoh's household noticed. Pharaoh called her in. Pharaoh took Sarah as his wife. And that's when things got a little messy. Except Abraham, in the meantime, because, she, because he was Sarah's brother... Oh, well, you know, Abraham, if I can have your sister Sarah, here's some donkeys. Here's some oxen. Here's some sheep. You know, what else do you need, Abraham? I really got to have Sarah. So, you know, since you're her brother, what more can I give you? I can almost imagine Abraham standing there thinking, well, let's see, I could use a few more sheep and maybe a couple more oxen. Abraham got all of this. Because Sarah and he lied. Then it got messier yet. Because the Lord recognized that this wasn't right. And so Pharaoh's household became afflicted and plagued. And Pharaoh finally recognized, however that happened, he finally recognized he had been lied to. So he confronted Abraham, saying, Why did you do this? Look at the misery you're causing me in my life. Now take your wife and everything you've got and get out of here. Abraham came off smelling like a rose. He got all of that stuff. And Sarah too. Sarah, however, came out on the raw end of that deal. Does the end justify the means? Now step into the parable. Step into the parable from the Gospel of Luke today. Luke teaches an awful lot about the proper use of wealth and possessions. And in this text, he teaches it through Jesus' parable in a rather unusual way. Boy, I just got called on the carpet by my boss. I'm in trouble. I've been spending his money doing things that he didn't want done. I've been buying things that he doesn't get. I've been feathering my own nest. And the worst part of it is a boss found out. I'm in trouble. He's called me on the carpet, and now he wants a full accounting of everything that I've done. My goose is cooked. He's going to find out, and I'm going to get canned. This time tomorrow, I'll be out of a job. What am I going to do? I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and do manual labor, and there's no way I'm going out into the community to beg. There's no way. My pride just isn't going to let me do that. I've had this really sweet job and, and been well respected. I'm not going to go out and beg. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Sir, you're one of my debtors, my master's debtors. How many, how many uh, jugs of olive oil you owe him? A hundred? Write down 50. Give him 50 and we'll call it even. All right? Good. Now, don't forget what I did for you. And man, that bakery business you've gotten, you're going through a lot of wheat, but I know sometimes the price of bread isn't all that great. You owe him a hundred measures of wheat. Scribble down 80. Is that okay with you? All right, now don't forget what I did for you. Don't forget. Ah, now I'm all set. I've got at least a couple people who will deal well with me when I'm canned when I don't have an income. They're not going to forget, are you? You're not going to forget that I helped them out, bailed them out, and so, so now if I can do that with every one of my master's debtors, I'm really well taken care of. Whew. That's awfully good. Does the end justify the means? Does the end justify the means? If it does, then I want to find that manager who conned debtors into, into all of that. I want to find him and introduce him to the, the guy that's handling my car loan. <laughs> and I want to introduce him to, to the guy that's, that's handling my house loan and get him to convince them, you know, could you write off about 10 years on that house? Could you write off a couple years on that car? And if they'd agree to that, mm, boy that manager would be, would be my friend for a long, long time. That'd be sweet. Anybody else want access to the same manager? You can have him when I'm done with him, but until then, he's mine. Does the end justify the means? It seems like it. Because Jesus, in this parable, says that the master of the whole business compliments the dishonest manager for being so shrewd. He compliments him for reducing a hundred to fifty and a hundred to eighty. The master came up on the short end of the stick because of this dishonest manager. And yet, the master praises the dishonest manager. That's enough to leave your head scratching. Why is it? Why is it that this guy that was dishonest from the day one until the day after he was canned, or the day he was canned, why is it that he's praised? The master found out hey, you've been acting pretty shrewdly. You've made good use of the olive oil. You've made good use of the wheat. Nice job. But neither one of them were yours to give. What is it, that's Je what, what is it that Jesus is teaching us? What is it that he's trying to drive home for us in this parable? Somehow or another, Jesus says, we need to separate the manager's actions from the effects of the actions of the debtors. Somehow or another, you and I are called to give an accounting of our stewardship, daily stewardship. How is it that we are using the things that God gives us? And how is it that we're allowing others to use the things that God gives them? In our own mind, we can rationalize just about anything. We can think it through and twist and turn things in our own minds to make it sound like everything is just fine, even if we just stole somebody else's purse to take the money and buy something for someone else. If it comes out good, it's easy for us to say, then the process must have been worth it. But Jesus calls us to the best process for the best outcome. 
the newspaper this past week, there was a story of a woman who some weeks ago had been behind a, a mother in the line at Walmart and paid for the diapers. Somehow or another, someone else videotaped that and that, that clip went viral. People recognized that this was someone stepping out on their own with their own possessions to make life better for someone else. It wasn't a matter of the woman saying, well, I'll distract them and you just kind of sneak out the door with the diapers. She was saying, no, here, I'll put the cash on the counter. I'll pay for the diapers. Woman using her own gifts to gift someone else. The process of using what is ours, what God has given us for the benefit of someone else. Luke calls us to a radical, radical use of our possessions. It's actually Jesus who calls us through this gospel writer, Luke. Jesus at times says we're supposed to give up everything. Other times he says we're supposed to be good managers. In this matter, he's saying, be accountable for what you are doing and how you are doing it. It's not a matter of praising dishonesty. It's a matter of praising the use of what's been given. So back to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham came out pretty sweet on that whole deal. He came out with sheep and oxen and donkeys and Sarah too. Yes, they had to leave Egypt. But somehow or another, Abraham came out on top. Was he dishonest? Of course he was. Was Sarah a liar? Sure she was. Were they still children of God? Yes, without a doubt. And there's the gospel for us. Even though we are at times dishonest managers of God's gifts to us, we are still God's children. Even though we benefit from all of those things listed in Psalm 8, and misuse them, neglect them, abuse them. We are still God's children, loved by him, showered with good gifts by him, redeemed by him. We've been created by him and recreated by him. But we live in tension. We live in tension. And in the tail end of that, gospel text for today, the last four verses, 10, 11, 12, and 13, read, Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own. No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. There's the tension we live in. We can't get along in life without money and wealth, and we can't get along in life if it takes over our life. There's the tension we live in. And it's God who calls us to right behavior in receiving it, sharing it, and using it. Even in the commandments, God says, don't covet what is someone else's. Don't steal what is someone else's. In fact, encourage them, help them protect what is theirs, 
help them safeguard what is theirs and enjoy the gifts that God gives. You and I are created but a little lower than the angels, and he's crowned us with glory and with honor. Time after time after time, in spite of our sin, we live in glory. In spite of our sin, we are redeemed. In spite of our sin, we are loved and showered with marvelous gifts. Let us use them to God's glory. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the abundance of the earth that you shower upon us. Thank you for entrusting to us the gifts of the earth, the talents we have, and the companions of those around us. Bless us, Lord, as we seek ways to use the gifts according to your command and for the advancement of your kingdom and the proclamation of your word. Amen.